Hello everyone and welcome to Stitching Ain't Easy. My name is Ashley. Thank you all so very much for joining me today for another episode of Crime and Crochet. Um, I have my Crime and Crochet sticker. It's kind of bland behind me. We are days from moving and I keep promising to bring this to you guys and I had a minute to do so. So here we are. So okay. It's kind of bland but we're just going to pretend. So. Our crime and crochet sticker <laughs> and our crime and crochet shirt, so we are somewhat prepared. Try to be okay. So, all right. Um, this is a series that I have made. I believe two of these so far. So this would be the third one because that's how math works. Um, and it's called crime and crochet because, well, this is a crochet channel. I'm going to tell true crime stories. My original idea was to well, crochet while I talk to you guys and to tell you, you know, about the case while making something with you all and just kind of have like a conversation. Um, I very quickly noticed, even in the first episode, that that wasn't going to work out. <laughs> that um, I said this last time that I'm not really a walk and chew bubble gum type of a person. Like I, I am, but also I'm not. Um, as far as like reading and counting to crochet and telling a story and trying to put emphasis into the story and not just sound blah and drab because it's they're all very important. Um, I decided that personally I'm not going to crochet. Um, however, I would love it if you all would still crochet or do whatever you're doing. Some of you just listen, whatever it is that you do, knitting, painting, cleaning, whatever, driving, I don't know, whatever y'all are doing, um, but just, um, yeah, and not only even just, like, being able to crochet and tell the story, but also it just seems sort of disrespectful, I don't know, um, like to the victims and to the families and things for me to, you know, make something so... I wrote myself a little thing so I can kind of tell you guys my plan because I've been trying for a while now I keep mentioning that like I want to do something that still has to do with crochet while I'm doing these because that's what it's called it's crime and crochet but also be respectful because that's the most important thing on these I can tell talk about crochet in any other video that's kind of the whole point of this one so you know it's just to yeah, so, okay, <clears throat> so, like I said, uh, before we get started on our story today, I want to tell you all that I've decided to keep crime and crochet respectful to the families involved, um, while also involving crocheting, reset all this, I didn't think that it was appropriate for myself to crochet while telling tragic stories of the victims and their families. Once again, I think it's wonderful if you all want to crochet, and if you want to tell me what you're working on, I would love to hear about your projects. As for myself, I'm going to bring you the cases and that alone, and I will not be crocheting while telling you the story. So here's what I have decided to do. Okay, I'm kind of excited about it, um, because I've thought for a couple of months <laughs> about what could I possibly do to make this still combine both things. So, okay. So in lieu of crocheting, like personally, um, while I tell a story, or tell our story, the case, what we're doing, um, I'm going to make one to several projects. We'll just see how it goes, um, depending on what I can get finished. Um, I at one point had a central machine. It started dropping stitches. I'm planning on once we get moved, hopefully getting another central machine and so like maybe make several hats, um, some headbands, some scarves, you know, maybe just some little amigurumis, whatever, shawls, I don't know, just make things. Also still make things for the women's shelter, but do this and make things for crime and crochet, okay? And I'm going to show you guys those items at the first of our episode and just kind of tell you a little bit about it, like, you know, the yarn, the hook, the project, the pattern the usual stuff, am I right? Tell you guys all of those things. And then, 
um, there is a local shop near to us and they've told me before that I can bring things in and sell them. Um, there's also another shop just up the road that has handmade items for sale in their store. So my plan is to take the things that I make specifically for Crime and Crochet, like I said, the other things are donations um, to the women's shelter, but for Crime and Crochet. I'm going to take those to the local shop and whatever sells, hopefully the things sell, am I right? But I'm going to do donate all of the proceeds to the Innocence Project. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Innocence Project, just in case you've never heard of it. It's an absolutely phenomenal organization. So, okay. Uh, the Innocence, Pro Innocence Project, according to their own website, works to free the innocence, prevent works to free the innocent, prevent wrongful convictions, and create fair, compassionate, and equitable systems of justice for everyone. Founded in 1992 by Barry C. Sheck and Peter J. Newfield at the Benjamin N. Cordoza School of Law at the Yesheva University, the organization is now an independent nonprofit. So our work is guided by science and grounded in anti-racism. These are, they are a wonderful organization who has freed over 375 people, 375 innocent people as of 2021 through DNA-based exonerations, including 21 who served time on death row. These people served an average of 14 years in prison before exoneration and release. Um, I was looking it up and it's an average of like combined, it's like 3,000 or 5,000 years, something insane like that, that innocent people were behind bars. And I would like to also mention, not only are they innocent behind bars, but if they're innocent behind, like, you know, being held captive for murder, that just means the murderer is still out there, free, roaming the streets. So through DNA, um, they have solved several cases, went back, done several cold cases, as I mentioned, over 375 people have been set free because of the Innocence Project and their amazing work. And so that's what I'm going to do. Make the things, sell the things, donate the funds to the Innocence Project. So that's what is going to happen from here on out in Crime and Crochet. I don't have anything to show you all today simply because, as I mentioned about 48 times, we're moving. We have this long. So I don't have anything to show you guys today, but before my next one, I will have something for sure to share with you all. Um, and that's my best idea right now, is just to take it to, like I said, a local store, local shop, sell it. All of the proceeds, all of the profit then, donate to the Innocence Project. So that's the plan. Okay. Just wanted you guys to know that. All right, so now onto our story for today. Um, this one is not, <coughs> excuse me, um, not quite, not our usual like murder mystery situation. This is just kind of a really wacky tale. I'll say that. Um, perhaps you've heard of it. I do not know. It's kind of an internet sensation there for just a minute, I think. Okay, so this is the case of William West and Will West. Strange but true. Okay, this is a bizarre case and very interesting one of William West and Will West, two men who were incarcerated at the Leavenworth Penitentiary in Kansas in 1903. This case circulated around the internet and was said to have been the reason that police started to use fingerprints for identification. That's not true. That was like a big huge thing that, um, they would show their mug shots, which I will show you guys in just a minute. But um, yes, that that was why fingerprints came in to be, and that's that's it's you know not everything you know. Once again, my usual saying, as Abe Lincoln said, not everything you read on the internet is true. So there you go. That's one of those things. It wasn't really the basis of fingerprinting, although it had a lot to do with it. For sure. So, okay. So fingerprints have been used for a very long time. I'm going to give you guys like a quick 
history of that just because I found it quite interesting. I like to do a backstory and this was kind of the most backstory I could find. I really couldn't find anything on William West or Will West, so this is what we're going with. Okay, so the earliest use of fingerprints as a form of identification dates, dates back to the Qin Dynasty in China around 221 BC. Fingerprints continue to be used throughout the time across throughout time across Europe and Asia to identify people and to sign documents. The first system of classification of fingerprints was introduced by Jan Evangelista Perkinj. Sorry, I'm sure that's not even close. I apologize. A Czech psychologist in 1823. He divided the papillary lines into nine types based on their geometric arrangement. This work, however, was not internationally. This work, however, was not internationally recognized for many years. A murder case in Argentina in 1892 is considered the first homicide to be solved with the use of fingerprint evidence. The country became the first to rely solely on fingerprints as a method of identification. So, just a little bit about fingerprints, because, like I said, I just found this interesting. You know, they're like snowflakes. No one has the same one. It's just kind of neat. So, all right. So fingerprints have three basic ridge patterns. There's an arch, a loop, and a whorl. Arches are an area of the pattern type where ridges enter on one side and exit on the other side. Loops have ridges that enter on one side and exit on the same side. And finally, whorls consist of circles, more than one loop or a mixture of pattern types. A rare genetic disease known as a dermatoglophia <laughs> causes patients to be born without fingerprints which is pretty wild. Um, it says, there are also toe prints. A fetus's toe prints develop at the same time as fingerprints and are just as unique. Since criminals are more likely to leave fingerprints behind, the FBI maintains a national database that link links 66 million people to their fingerprints, but does not record or toe or footprints. So, which makes sense, I guess. Not a lot of criminals probably are barefoot. That's probably kind of a rarity, so makes sense. All right, so now on to this bizarre case. Here we go. In 1903, at the Leavenworth Penitentiary in Northeast Kansas, police brought a man in by the name of Will West. The man was convicted of manslaughter and was set to serve 10 years. Upon Will West's arrival to the prison, an officer asked, what now? What have you done now? To which Will, Re Will West replied that he had never been in prison before. He had never even been convicted of a crime. The officer thought that he was joking. He looked so familiar, and the officer was holding the man's file. This man looked identical to a man that the officer knew as William West. He shared the same name and as the man the clerk knew, and he also looked like the William West that the clerk knew. The clerk was not shocked or startled and simply muttered, mm -hmm, <laughs> to the man that he was looking while he was looking at his file the whole time. Will West was shown the mugshot from the file. He said, that may be my photo, but I don't know how you got it. I've never been here before. Prison officials suspected West of posing as a newcomer, perhaps in, host perhaps in hopes of being assigned different work duties. But why would he use his real name? That would only ensure that his ruse could easily be discovered. Upon further investigations, officers noticed that Will West was already in prison in Leavenworth, Kansas, the same prison where Will West was being booked. William West was in Leavenworth prison, serving a life sentence for first degree murder. The police were baffled. How could they possibly be booking Will West into prison when he was already an inmate? 
Will West was then checked with the file that they had on who they thought was the same man they had already captured. When they looked, they realized that there were actually two Will Wests. Both men had been booked into the same prison. Both shared the same name, although the men had already, although the man had already been in prison for murder, went by William West. Both men had almost identical facial features. Here is the mugshot of the two men, one named William West and the other Will West. Officers then checked in on William West, the convicted murderer. He was found where he was supposed to be, at his post in a prison workshop. Two years prior, in 1901, William West was convicted in what counted as a formal procedure. William West's Bertillion measurements were taken, and they were compiled in an archive file for the inmate, and William West was informed about prison rules and told the number of the cell that he would be living in for the rest of his life. In 1903, the police then checked the West they were booking in by the Bertillion identification system. The Bertillion system for criminal identification was developed by the French handwriting expert, dedicated criminologist, and biometrics researcher Alfonso Bertillion. From 1887, this was implemented throughout the U.S. penitentiaries so that they could keep a detailed report card for all the inmates. It was nothing but a criminal mugshot, only with a detailed description of the person's face attached to the photo. The system had worked for a little while. Criminals were identified by their picture and their full name only. It took no more than two decades for a person to emerge that bore the striking re resemblance to another. Okay, this is the, this is where it gets real wild. Okay, so according to the Bertillion system, the results of both men were as follows. <clears throat> Okay, so I'm going to say Will, Re Will West's results first and William West's results second. Keep in mind, Will West is the one that they're booking. William West is the one that's been there. So I'm going to say the one that they're booking is first. Okay, so this is what they measured. Head length, 19.7 inches, 19.8 inches. Head breadth, 15.8 inches, 15.9 inches. Middle finger. 12.3, 12.2. Foot length, this is the biggest difference. 28.2, 27.5. Forearm length, 50.2, 50.3. Height, 178.5, 177.5. Little finger, 9.7, 9.6. Trunk, 91.3, 91.3. Arm span, 187, 188. Ear length, 6.6, 6.6. Cheek width, 14.8, 14.8. They were almost identical. William West was brought into a room. He looked startlingly, startlingly like Will West. Both men had their fingerprints taken and compared. The patterns bore no resemblance. The fallibility of these three systems of personal identification, photographs, Bertillion measurements, and names was demonstra demonstrated in this one case. The value of fingerprints as a means of identification was obvious. According to legend, the Leavenworth Warden, R. W. McClary declared this is the death of Bertillionage and discontinued using this me method of identification. After the Will West and William West case, most police departments began using photographs, Bertillion measure measurements, and fingerprints on their mugshots. Eventually, the Bertillion system was discarded. This story 
is somewhat sensationalized and omits personal record information uncovered by later researchers, indicating that Will and William West both corresponded with the same family members and thus were probably related. Prison records also cite that Leavenworth inmate George Bean reported that he knew William and Will West in their home territory before prison and that they were twin brothers. Their exact relationship, if any, is unknown. What is factual is that the two Wests were not unusual as many people with the same anthropometric measurements. It is generally accepted that identical twins will have the same or almost the same anthropometric measurements, yet have easily differentiated fingerprints, which is why fingerprints are used more widely today in measurements or not. The men's prison records, including their almost identical mugshot matching Bertillion measurements and mismatched fingerprints, survive to, authent survive to authenticate an amazing coincidence. Will West, the newer prisoner, served his manslaughter sentence and then was released. He left no trail after his release and was never heard from again, basically disappearing from history. William West, the lifer, spent time in solitary confinement for fighting and creating disturbances during his early years behind bars. He was then released on parole in 1919, but not before making a dash for freedom. By 1916, West was a model prisoner and a trustee. One afternoon, he succumbed to, ten succumbed to temptation, as he put it, and walked away. He hopped on a freight train and made it as far as Topeka, Kansas, before he was arrested the next day and returned to Leavenworth. The police officers who picked him up did not need fingerprints to confirm that he was an escapee. A prison, a prison issued circular with his mugshot and a written inscription had already reached Topeka. These days, fingerprints remain critical for identification in the criminal justice system along with some amazing developments in DNA, which is just so cool. If you guys like look into that in the slightest bit, it's just amazing. All the cold cases that they've been solving, because people do like the 23andMe things and then they figure it all out. It's just, it's fascinating beyond measure to me. So, okay. So that is our case. That is the story of Will and William West. Wild, but yeah, according to the internet's um, that's what it says on there a lot, that they are the reason for fingerprinting, but technically, so the case in Argentina a while before was really the where it all originated. They had been doing fingerprints for a long time before then, and they obviously had been doing fingerprints at Leavenworth Prison because the guys just came in there and they were able to do fingerprints, so that's not necessarily true. However, I feel like it did probably kind of jumpstart a lot of a lot more of fingerprints being used for sure. My goodness gracious. So okay, so that is our story. <laughs> as wild as it may be, um, as I mentioned, the next one will be a little bit more serious. But um, not to say that this one isn't serious. Mistaken identity. It's nothing short of serious. My goodness. But. Um, it, like I said, it isn't really the murder mystery part. It's kind of after they were convicted and all of that. But um, So I'm going to link the information about the Innocence Project below if you guys are interested in checking that out at all. So um, like I said, they're an amazing organization and I really, I can't wait to do that, to make some things and to donate some things and hopefully, you know, help some innocent people out of prison that don't deserve to be there when there are actual criminals just walking the streets, so, okay. So thank you all so very much for listening to our case today. Um, as I mentioned, I will be back soon with more of a murder mystery type video, or type case. Um, yeah, um, it's just taken me a little bit. I've mentioned that a few times. It's just, it's a lot, and so it's taken me a lot to kind of compile all the information because I keep needing it take a brain break and just not think about it, but, um, that's a really good one, so that'll be coming up very soon, well, not very soon, probably a couple weeks once we, you know, get situated at the new house and all those things, so, 
but yes so thank you all so very much for listening to our case and thank you so very much for watching crime and crochet like i said i will link about the innocence project below and i will be back before very long to show you all a project that i'm going to hopefully <laughs> be able to sell and donate and also another crime and crochet case so thank you all so very much and i hope you have a wonderful day once again thank you for listening to crime and crochet